Cannery Row by John Steinbeck Chapter 1 Li Chung's grocery, while not a model of neatness, was a miracle of supply. It was small and crowded, but within its single room a man could find everything he needed or wanted to live and to be happy. Clothes, food, both fresh and canned, liquor, tobacco, fishing equipment, machinery, boats, cordage, caps, pork chops. You could buy at Lee Chong's a pair of slippers, a silk kimono, a quarter pint of whiskey, and a cigar. You could work out combinations to fit almost any mood. The one commodity Lee Chong did not keep could be had across the lot at Dora's. The grocery opened at dawn and did not close until the last wandering vagrant dime had been spent or retired for the night. Not that Li Chong was avaricious. He wasn't. But if one wanted to spend money, he was available. Li's position in the community surprised him as much as he could be surprised. Over the course of the years, everyone in Cannery Row owed him money. He never pressed his clients, but when the bill became too large, Li cut off credit. Rather than walk into the town up the hill, the client usually paid or tried to. Lee was round-faced and courteous. He spoke a stately English without ever using the letter R. When the tongue wars were going on in California, it happened now and then that Lee found a price on his head. Then he would go secretly to San Francisco and enter a hospital until the trouble blew over. What he did with his money, no one ever knew. Perhaps he didn't get it. Maybe his wealth was entirely in unpaid bills. But he lived well, and he had the respect of all his neighbors. He trusted his clients until further trust became ridiculous. Sometimes he made business errors, but even these he turned to advantage and goodwill, if in no other way. It was that way with the Palace Flop House and Grill. Anyone but Lee Chung would have considered the transaction a total loss. Lee Chung's station in the grocery was behind the cigar counter. The cash register was then on his left and the abacus on his right. Inside the glass case were the brown cigars, the cigarettes, the bull durham, the duke's mixture, the five brothers, while behind him in the racks on the wall were the pints, half pints, and quarters of Old Green River, Old Townhouse, Old Colonel, and the favorite, Old Tennessee, a blended whiskey guaranteed four months old very cheap, and known in the neighborhood as Old Tennis Shoes. Lee Chong did not stand between the whiskey and the customer without reason. Some very practical minds had on occasion tried to divert his attention to another part of the store. Cousins, nephews, sons and daughters-in-law waited on the rest of the store, but Lee never left the cigar counter. The top of the glass was his desk. His fat, delicate hands rested on the glass, the fingers moving like small, restless sausages. A broad golden wedding ring on the middle finger of his left hand was his only jewelry, and with it he silently tapped on the rubber change mat from which the little rubber tits had long been worn. Lee's mouth was full and benevolent, and the flash of gold when he smiled was rich and warm. He wore half-glasses, and since he looked at everything through them, he had to tilt his head back to see in the distance. Interest and discounts, addition, subtraction, he worked out on the abacus with his little restless sausage fingers, and his brown friendly eyes roved over the grocery, and his teeth flashed at the customers. On an evening when he stood in his place on a pad of newspaper to keep his feet warm, he contemplated with humor and a sadness a business deal that had been consummated that afternoon and reconsummated later that same afternoon. When you leave the grocery store, if you walk catty-cornered across the grass-grown lot, threading your way among the great rusty pipes thrown out of the canneries, you will see a path worn in the weeds. Follow it past the cypress tree, across the railroad track, up a chicken walk with cleats, and you will come to a long, low building which for a long time was used as a storage place for fish meal. It was just a great big roofed room, 
and it belonged to a worried gentleman named Horace Abbeville. Horace had two wives and six children, and over a period of years he had managed through pleading and persuasion to build a grocery debt second to none in Monterey. That afternoon he had come into the grocery, and his sensitive, tired face had flinched at the shadow of sternness that crossed Lee's face. Lee's fat finger tapped the rubber mat. Horace laid his hands palm up on the cigar counter. I guess I owe you plenty of dough, he said simply. Lee's teeth flashed up in appreciation of an approach so different from any he had ever heard. He nodded gravely, but he waited for the trick to develop. Horace wet his lips with his tongue, a good job from corner to corner. I hate to have my kids, which, with that hanging over them, he said. Why, I bet you wouldn't let them have a pack of spearmint now. Lee Chong's face agreed with this conclusion. Plenty dough, he said. Horace continued. You know that place of mine across the track up there where the fish meal is? Lee Chong nodded. It was his fish meal. Horace said earnestly. If I was to give you that place, would it clear me up with you? Lee Chung tilted his head back and stared at Horace through his half-glasses, while his mind flicked among accounts and his right hand moved restlessly to the abacus. He considered the construction which was flimsy and the lot which might be valuable if a cannery ever wanted to expand. Sure, said Lee Chung. Well, get out the accounts and I'll make you a bill of sale on that place. Horace seemed in a hurry. No need papers, said Lee. I make paid in full paper. They finished the deal with dignity, and Lee Chung threw in a quarter pint of old tennis shoe. And then Horace Abbeville walked very straight, went across the lot and past the cypress tree, and across the track, and up the chicken walk and into the building that had been his. And he shot himself on a heap of fish meal. And although it has nothing to do with this story, no Abbeville child, no matter who its mother was, knew the lack of a spearmint, stick of spearmint afterward. But to get back to the evening, Horace was on the trestles with the embalming needles in him, and his two wives were sitting on the steps of his house with their arms about each other. They were good friends until after the funeral, and then they divided up the children and never spoke to each other again. Lee Chung stood in the back of the cigar counter, and his nice brown eyes were turned inward on a calm and eternal Chinese sorrow. He knew he could not have helped it, but he wished he might have known and perhaps tried to help. It was deeply a part of Lee's kindness and understanding that man's right to kill himself is inviolable, and sometimes a friend can make it unnecessary. Lee had already underwritten the funeral and sent a wash basket of groceries to the stricken families. Now Lee Chong owned the Abbeville building, a good roof, a good floor, two windows, and a door. True, it was piled high with fish meal, and the smell of it was delicate and penetrating. Lee considered it as a storage for groceries, as a kind of warehouse, but he gave that up on second thought. It was too far away, and anyone can go in through a window. He was tapping the rubber mat with his gold ring and considering the problem when the door opened and Matt came in. Mac was the elder, leader, mentor, and to a small extent the exploiter of a little group of men who had in common no families, no money, and no ambitions beyond food, drink, and contentment. But whereas most men in their search for contentment destroy themselves and fall warily short of their targets, Mac and his friends approached contentment casually, quietly, and absorbed it gently. Mac and Hazel, a young man of great strength, Eddie, who filled in as a bartender at La Ida, Huey and Jones, who occasionally collected frogs and cats for Western Biological, were currently living in those large rusty pipes in the lot next to Lee Chong's. That is, they lived in the pipes when it was damp, but in fine weather they lived in the shadow of the black cypress tree at the top of the lot. The limbs folded down and made a canopy under which a man could lie and look out at the flow and vitality of Cannery Row. Lee Chong stiffened ever so slightly when Matt came in, 
and his eyes glanced quickly about the store to make sure that Eddie or Hazel or Huey or Jones had not come in too and drifted away among the groceries. Mac laid out his cards with a winning honesty. Lee, he said, I and Eddie and the rest heard you own the Abbeville place. Lee Chung nodded and waited. I and my friends thought we'd ask you if we could move in there. We'll keep up the property, he added quickly. Wouldn't let anybody break in or hurt anything. Kids might knock out the window, you know, Mike su Mac suggested. Place might burn down if somebody don't keep an eye on it. Lee tilted his head back and looked into Mac's eyes through the half-glasses, and Lee's tapping finger slowed its tempo as he thought deeply. In Mac's eyes there was good will and good fellowship, and a desire to make everyone happy. Why did Lee Chong feel slightly surrounded? Why did his mind pick its way as delicately as a cat through a cactus? It had been done sweetly done, almost in spirit of philanthropy. Lee's mind leapt ahead at the possibilities. No, they were probabilities, and his finger tapping slowed still further. He saw himself refusing Mac's request, and he saw the broken glass from the windows. Then Mac would offer a second time to watch over and preserve Lee's property, and at the second refusal, Lee could smell the smoke, could see the little flames creeping up the walls. Mac and his friends would try to help to put it out. Lee's finger came to a gentle rest on the change mat. He was beaten. He knew it. There was left to him only the possibility of saving face, and Mac was likely to be very generous about that. Lee said, You like pay lent my place. You like live there same hotel. Mac smiled broadly and was generous. Say, he cried, that's an idea. Sure, how much? Lee considered. He knew it didn't matter what he charged. He wasn't going to get it anyway. He might just as well make it a really sturdy, face-saving sum. Five dollar week, said Lee. Mac played it through to the end. I'll have to talk to the boys about it, he said dubiously. Couldn't you make that four dollars a week? Five dollar, said Lee firmly. Well, I'll see what the boys say, said Mac. And that was the way it was. Everyone was happy about it. And if it be thought that Lee Chong suffered a total loss, at least he did not work that way. At least his mind did not work that way. The windows were not broken, fire did not break out, and while no rent was ever paid, if the tenants ever had any money, and quite often they did, it never occurred to them to spend it any place except at Lee Chong's grocery. What he had was a little group of active and potential customers under wraps. But it went further than that. If a drunk caused trouble in the grocery, if the kids swarmed down from New Monterey and tent on plunder, Lee Chung only had to call and his tenants rushed to his aid. One further bond it established. You cannot steal from your benefactor. The saving to Lee Chung in cans of beans and tomatoes and milk and watermelons more than paid the rent. And if there was a sudden and increased leakage among the groceries in New Monterey, that was none of Lee Chung's affair. The boys moved in and the fish meal moved out. No one knows who named the place that has been known ever after as the Palace Flop House and Grill. In the pipes and under the cypress tree, there had been no room for furniture, and the little niceties which are not only the diagnosis but the boundaries of our civilization. Once in the palace flop house, the boys set about furnishing it. A chair appeared, and a cot, and another chair. A hardware store supplied a can of red paint, not reluctantly, because it never knew about it. And as a new table or footstool appeared, it was painted, which not only made it very pretty, but also disguised it to a certain extent in case the former owner looked in. And the palace flop house and grill began to function. The boys could sit in front of their door and look down across the track and across the lot and across the street, right into the front windows of Western Biological. They could hear the music from the laboratory at night, and their eyes followed Doc across the street when he went to Lee Chong's for beer. And Max said, That Doc is a fine fellow. We ought to do something for him. <laughs>